everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I just want to take a second to uh, to introduce the, the moderator here. Uh, this is Lulani Arquette. She's the executive director of Native Arts and Culture Foundation. And uh, just to uh, welcome you here, um, we I passed out some evaluation forms that uh, after the idea form, if you'd go ahead and fill them out and uh, turn them in at the, uh, the registration desk. And Brian there is passing out some uh, uh, panel bios. So you know, please feel free to uh, take a look at those. And right after the idea forum, uh, this is going to go until 3.30. And after the idea forum, starting at 4 o'clock is an art crawl in the Pearl District. So make sure you put on your, your coat and your uh, umbrella. And uh, we'll give you a map and point you in the right direction. Right, take it away. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So I just want to welcome all of you. Avelina Mai, Mei Ke Aloha. Um, as, he, as Alec mentioned, my name is Lulani Arquette, and I'm with the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. We'll be moderating this wonderful panel today. And uh, just a little bit about the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. We're a fairly new, or, new foundation. We're located here in the Pacific Northwest, and we are uh, national. We provide support to Native Hawaiian, Alaska, Native and American Indian artists, communities, and organizations. So we're really excited to be here. We, we're really pleased that you all could come and that uh, we can share with you some, some fun and uh, hopefully intense information today. And I want to thank Olga for uh, great English up here and the NPN band staff for inviting us to, to present this panel today. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so. One of the things, uh, I'm going to start, let me start in a kind of an appropriate way, um, what we call it appropriate Native Hawaiian ways. So from where the sun rises at the gates of Tahiti Ku in the east, to where it sets in the Red Sea at the gates of Tahiti Moi in the west, from the Venus to the horizon, from the deepest sea to the highest mountain, all love, honor, and respect goes to the Creator, to the spirits of the heavens, the seas, and the land, and to all those who still watch over us, guide us, and protect us, and to our ancestors, those elders who still walk on this plane with us and grace us with their wisdom and presence, and to all those other ancestors who await us in the great beyond and who sleep the long sleep for the winters and the summers. So welcome. So, uh, today we have four Native artists who are going to uh, present, and we actually titled the, uh, the panel, but we didn't get it in the, the program apparently, Reimagining Indigeneity. That's what they're going to talk about related to their work and how that is reflected in their work uh, along with other contemporary issues that they may want to bring up. But before we start, I want to provide a little bit of context and one of the most probably misunderstood uh, aspects about Native peoples today is this myth of, of one monolithic Native community across the nation that shares the same beliefs and the same cultures. And that is uh, absolutely not true, as most of you folks know. And in fact, what's interesting is when you really delve into this, it's very complex. It's complicated. It's complicated in native indigenous communities, so I know it's complicated for the broader population. And we always hope to shed some light on that from individual perspectives, but there are actually 562 um, uh, federally recognized tribes in the United States, and uh, about 200 of those are in Alaska, and the other uh, are, are spread across about 36 states here on the continent. And that's only federally recognized tribes. Then we have some state recognized tribes where other native peoples are, are, are members of. And then we have those native peoples that identify as native that are actually, a lot of them living in urban areas and not really affiliated with any tribe, federally or state recognized, but still very much strongly identify as native. So you can see this gets really complicated. And in, in Hawaii, we are not, we're state recognized, but we're not federally recognized. And we, there are 400,000 Native Hawaiians and about half live in Hawaii. 
and the other half live up here on the continent. So this is a very, this identity issue is a very complex issue. Uh, we all individually have multiple identities, really, and we, we explain that in many different ways that you're going to hear today. So um, I think the most important thing to remember is that each Native tribe and a Native group has its very own unique, distinct culture, arts, languages, uh, social political systems, and beliefs, and how they also interpret that in living in modern contemporary society. That's the tribe or the Native group, and then within that tribe and Native group, all kinds of stuff. You've got all kinds of individual people with all kinds of other multiple identities. So you can see how this can get complicated, and we we just hope that, we found that as Native peoples, we're, we're, we, we are always navigating through those tensions between you know, the past, the present, uh, the, how we're informed on our cultural beliefs, and what we call uh, modern Western uh, ideologies, and the racial stereotypes, and then who we really are. So it's always you know, a, a journey that we're all traveling here. But there are artists and there's tradition bearers who are preserving and they are um, extending their cultural traditions. And then thousands of artists are contemporizing, I would say, use that word, their arts. And they are um, often taking and venturing with, into new mediums. They're uh, using sometimes traditions of, of uh, new ways of expressing themselves through other traditional groups and pop culture and their own exploration. So it's just, it's, it's fascinating, it's wonderful to see. And at the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, we're always, uh, we're always surprised about that. Um, so these artists here that you see and the many other Native artists and, and curators, uh, they're reimagining, they're reflecting, they're resurrecting, they are very much uh, passionately pursuing their creative energy. And we really believe that um, the Native contemporary artists are working in a lot of new terrain. It's, it's very exciting. And they're adding a really vital contribution to the national discussion. And they also can add um, interdisciplinary conversation, exploration, and even solutions to some of the, the many social and uh, economic and, and cultural problems that we face in this nation. So. Um, Without further uh, ado, I want to give enough time for the artists. Let's go to our panelists here. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And let's get out of here. And uh, our first one is going to be Dina. Do you want me to yeah. get up or just to introduce myself? Would you like to come up here? Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lulani. My name is Dina Dart. I'm Coastal Chumash. My, fam my mother's family is from the Montecito, Santa Barbara, California area. And, um, and at home we say, Haku Metchumawish, which means hello and um, let us be healthy in our interactions with one another. Um, thank you so much, Lulani, for, for these beautiful gifts and for the invitation to to participate with these very skilled, talented artists, and um, and in a group of people of like-minded like individuals, which is always refreshing and always sort of reinvigorates um, my passion to do the work that I do. Um, so, should I, I can just launch right into it? Awesome. Oh, that's a lot of words. So um, <laughs> there are there are certain. Oh, and, it, it, and it, I don't know why that keeps doing that. Sorry. Um, so I've been at the Portland Art Museum since 2012. Uh, the Portland Art Museum has an incredible collection of historic Native American art, and, and then it had a very tiny collection of contemporary Native art. And um, after 12 years of studying rep the representation of my community and California Indian people, and, um, and this, this real sort of um, a public perception of this sna ethnographic snapshot in time as being, you know, Lulani spoke to that, this sort of, um, the real Indians are a thing of the past and, and living Indian people aren't really native anymore or aren't, you know, aren't practicing their culture and their traditions. And in California, um, most of us 
are largely disenfranchised from our tribal homelands as well. So, um, so there's a real need to assert our identity at every opportunity that we get. And the, the museums work against that um, because they, rep they show our lives as pre-contact people and very rarely show us in the present. Um, and never tell, tell the visitor, sometimes they'll do the past and the present, but never the story in between, right? And, um, you know, it, it'll refer to Native people as being resilient or, um, or persistent, right? But what have we actually survived is never, is never discussed. Anyways, and so I came to the Portland Art Museum not only with that personal background and community background, but also my dissertation research that looked at those institutions that are continuing to um, assert those narratives of, you know, either either disappearing or disappeared the past, you know, uh, centering us in the past. Um, and so my my plan, as soon as I arrived at the Portland Art Museum, was to really develop the contemporary presence, the um, the, the living art. There's such great, amazing, incredible uh, native art out there, and it, it wasn't present at the Portland Art Museum. So. Um, to do that, right, I've had to develop relationships with living artists and, and with um, the communities that we're representing in our historic works. And one of the things that we talked about as a group um, in, a, in a conference call was that we're grappling, you know, those of us that are working in the field of Native American art as artists and curators and, and um, you know, arts professionals, grant writers, um, we're talking about a whole spectrum of identity, right? We're talking about um, people who live on the reservation and practice traditional or customary arts that they learn from their families and, and there's very little divergence from that, all the way to, you know, um, edgy, modern, um, even Western influenced work, hip hop and, you know, things that, that people um, other than, people outside of the Native community don't think of of as Native American art, right? There's this really dynamic spectrum that we're talking about. And so, um, but in order to be able to exhibit that spectrum, um, I've got to be working with not only the artists, but the communities, right? And who inform those historic works that have very little documentation. And then we would be restoring connections between the communities and those ancestral objects, and in some cases, returning those ancestral objects to the communities so that they can um, heal and do the work that they were meant to do, right, rather than being on view in the museum. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to do in, in addition to, you know, making those connections and developing an advisory committee of Native people to inform this work was to create a dedicated space just for contemporary art in the Native American galleries and um, and we opened that space about a month ago with an inaugural exhibit of um, contemporary Oregon Indian artists and um, and it's incredible and it's this really bright dynamic space that you cannot leave thinking that Indians are a thing of the past or that they're only producing beadwork or you know um, whatever misconceptions they arrive with they, they can't leave with those same uh, misconceptions and so it's it's effective, and, it, and so the docents are even using it on their tour now. They're bringing kids into that space and talking about how the art, how the art is actually developing um, within the space. So Sarah intends to come and take some of her baskets and take them out gathering, and then bring them back and put them back on the shelf. And while they're gone, there'll be a little sign that says, this huckleberry basket is in use right now. <laughs> and, um, and today, right now, actually, Greg Robinson is installing a component onto a piece of art that's in the space. So he's going to make wood chips in the space right now. Um, luckily, they're filming it. Um, and install this component. And, um, and Greg Archuleta is going to install a component as uh, the sun returns to the Northwest over the next couple of months. So you know, there's, there, are, there are, you know, the, the art itself is living and, and, um, and dynamic. And so, um, so I'm, I'm taking a lot of space, this, a lot of time. This is the space, and, um, and it now is, um, is, is hung with some of the most incredible Oregon Indian art. And here is Greg Robinson, Sarah Seastream, and, and Greg Archuleta. I'd encourage you to get over there if you haven't already. Um, it's on the third floor. 
uh, adjacent to the uh, Plateau in Western Oregon galleries. Um, and then in uh, February, February 6th, we open a uh, show, Contemporary Native Photographers and the Edward Curtis Legacy. Oh, oh darn it, man. Um, you might recognize the two ladies in the center um, <laughs> up here on our panel. Um, Wendy Red Star, Will Wilson, and um, and Zeke Jackson will be um, exhibiting their work in dialogue with um, with Edward Cur the Edward Curtis legacy. So not necessarily in dialogue with Curtis himself, but rather the legacy of that body of work and um, and all of its nuances. Um, so that opens in February. Right now, this this coming year, 2016. Um, Native American art has the main stage for almost the entire year, and that has never happened in the history of the Portland Art Museum. And, um, so it's a really exciting time, um, and a time where these um, these really deep thinking, talented people will be on the main stage speaking to the city of Portland and all the people that come here, and it's, it's so exciting. And then it's starting in June, we're hosting Native Fashion Now, which was curated by Karen Kramer at the Peabody Essex Museum. <coughs> um, uh, 60 Native American designers, artists, um, and uh, represented in 100 objects. It's, it's a dazzling show. Um, opens the beginning of June, June 4th. Um, and then in fall 2017, the Art of Resilience, a continuum of Klingon art that's really going to talk about the need for ancestral objects to return home and, um, and be treated as au rather than art and, um, and really showcasing the contemporary art um, as a sort of central um, content. So in, the, in this way, through these, um, through these efforts that are all very different, I'm trying to reach that full spectrum, right? Artists that are communicating to their audiences in, in ways that are very diverse. Um, so um, I see it as, as sort of my role at the museum to facilitate all of those voices. And um, so it's an honor to come here and speak to you about that and, and, and on a panel of people who are also committed to, um, to doing that. So thanks. computer thing right now real quick. We're going to have, we're going to do one more, Christopher, and then we're going to have some questions, comments, we want to have some dialogue with you folks. Uh, so if you have questions, you know, after the presenters, then just please jot them down and know that we're going to have, we're going to do two, one more, and then question and answer and some discussion, and then we'll have the last two, and then question and answer and discussion and interaction, okay? Okay. Thank you. Aloha, everybody. Aloha. Thanks for saying that back to me. Um, so my name is Christopher K. Morgan. I'm a Washington, D.C. area-based choreographer. Both of my parents are from Hawaii. I grew up in Southern California. And I always come to these things with a plan, and then my plan changes. And um, I had wanted to introduce my people to this space. I was so moved and thought it was just so mindful and beautiful how the organizers of this conference invited two local Native Indigenous people to bless the beginning. And I just, yeah, it really spoke to me. So I thought, okay, great, I'm going to do the same thing. And then Lulani happened to use this text that she blessed the space with in English. I was planning on doing something different, but I actually know something that's very parallel to that. So it's a very non-secular thing. You just heard the greeting that she said, and this is um, pretty close in parallel. I Ela e ku hiki ku ela e ku hiki moi. E ala ho ia u ua hiki mai oi. Ua la ka lani ua la ka honua. Ua la ka uka ua la ke kai. A ka hi e ke. Aloha. I hiki mai ai. So it's exactly what she said, where the sun rises and greets us and where it sets to go to sleep at night. Where the sea and the land meet. Where all of these things come together, we recognize almost like namaste, the aloha in you, and the aloha back. It's one of the things that I think is so interesting about the multiculturalism we all face is actually there's so much in common. And one of the things that I'm so moved by as an artist and what I see in other people's artwork a lot of the time is the striving for connecting those things and the connections that we can foster. 
and how it can ripple out so much further than any one of us and address so many of the big problems that we face. Um, sometimes, so these two awesome women are representing artists, many, many artists and many, many communities. I represent myself. And, um, <laughs> and in that, there's this huge multiplicity inside of me. But I thought it um, sometimes is easier just to let the artworks kind of speak for itself. So I'm going to show a little something, and then I want to explain why I chose to do that as uh, my initial sharing, what I'm going to show. I'm guessing. Thank you. Oh, there it is. Thank you. This will tell you. I will swish. I wonder if there's audio. There is. Great. <laughs> So there's a distinct lack of grass skirts, right? A distinct lack of grass skirts and coconut shell bras. Um, <laughs> there was one moment of headband or in, uh, ornamentation. It's so interesting and challenging to um, embrace all of who I am, and I think I'm not alone in that. I've been thinking a lot about labels, Hawaiian, German, Irish, Japanese, Chinese, those all exist in this blood flow. Queer, married, educator, dancer, choreographer, all the names people call me on the streets, which I won't repeat in this room. <laughs> all of those things exist here in so many more layers, and I think one of the things that's interesting and challenging for artists of all shades is how quickly and easily a label can become a trap. And to be an emerging artist, to be a mid-career artist, to be an established artist, and then that affects which grants you apply for and which grants you get booted out of. To be at a moment of advantage because my racial and ethnic makeup diversify a funding and applicant pool, create a programmatic roster that's to my advantage, thankfully, right at this particular blessed moment in time, which is a moment in time that could pass just as quickly as it creates my life. All of these things are really complex, and we are not alone in facing this, but we have a unique invisibility that I think is um, worth discussing and bringing up here today. And so I'm really moved by the efforts that the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, NPN, since its founding have been making. And it's, um, it's really uh, an important discussion to have, and it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable to me to say to a funding organization that funded me very beautifully that maybe I can recognize that I bring diversity. Is that what I want to be doing? I really chose that strategically not to have a lot of grass skirts and hula in it. Even though I'm deeply invested in that too, but it's just one aspect of who I am, and I think that's a fascinating subject for all of us to have to unpack and discover and analyze. Um, and as Lulani was already identifying, you know, sometimes I wonder, am I Hawaiian enough? And my Cousins that grew up in Hawaii often tell me that I'm not. They call me Haole all the time, which is, you know, a word for foreigner, but sometimes it means something a little more derogatory than that. But it's, you know, it's just this interesting tension that we all live in. And as I was developing this work that um, I did receive my creation fund for Hohaku, we had a, a production residency grant supported by NIFA last summer at the Maui Arts and Cultural Center. Colleen Furukawa is here. And um, 
you know, Colleen and I, about once every three days of the two weeks that I was there, we would check in and I'd go into her office, she'd come by our rehearsal, she'd say, you know, all the Hawaiians are coming, be ready, thicken your skin. And we got a wonderful response, which I think was, you know, fantastic, and they were supportive of that, but it's true. We're proving ourselves to each other just as much as we're trying to make ourselves be seen by the outside world. I thought I would finish um, my presentation. I have no idea what that elapsed time means, but I'm just going to finish this last little bit, um, with some footage from the development of this work, Kohaku, that happened during a residency last summer. Um, this work is looking at, Kohaku is a Hawaiian word for stone, and it's looking at an integration of many things, these identities that I find and feel inside myself, stories and the representation of stones in my particular culture, which have powerful resonance in many cultures throughout the world, but especially here in North America. Um, and I think the unique role that I have as a contemporary Native artist to bring and share that story with audiences that may not necessarily know about it. It's just a series of images. It won't give you the full effect, but let's see. Great, thank you. from the group of comments in, uh, about the anything you have from the first two panelists, or anything, just open up some discussion here. Yes? Um, for Vienna, I had a clarification question to the last slide. You showed uh, there were like two tunics, and you, I just want to be clear, you, I, I wasn't understanding if you said that those were being returned to, to mm -hmm. or? No, not all of them. I'm just going to grab my notes from up here so they're not surrounding the video. I'm sorry about that. Um, no, <laughs> not everything is being returned. However, there's going to be um, a pretty significant component of the show that's going to discuss and make transparent the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. There are cur currently 18 active claims on uh, Klingit objects. And so um, that's going to be part of the show. And we're hoping that there will actually be a repatriation ceremony where the, the museum will transfer ownership to the clans of Wrangell at the opening ceremony. Um, so it'll be a component, but those particular tunics are not, they don't have active claims on them. They're, they're not going to be repatriated. Probably, there are 18 claims, as I said, and, and the, the one we're repatriating first is a clan hat, and so that's the object that will be repatriated, if not before the show, at the show, and then the other 18 will work into resolve. And that is all that where, who, who takes them, and then where do they go? Is there a local display? So um, it's really, once we repatriate them, it's really not um, our, our business, what happens to them afterwards, the clans, you know, um, reintegrate them into their living culture. And um, the clan hats are, are especially important um, in order to um, maintain their, the social structure and the political, um, the political life of the Klingit. 
So um, what will likely happen is that the, the object will be housed at the, um, at the museum in Wrangell and so that the clan can check it out anytime that they need it. Um, but again, it's not, that's not something that they have to disclose to us. When we, when we transfer ownership, it, tr it transfers into the hands of the clan. Any other questions, comments? Yes. I'm just, I'm just interested uh, when you were performing your contemporary work in Hawaii. Um, I would love to see what some of the comments from the native people there mm -hmm. about work. Who maybe have, have, you have not seen contemporary yes before, like before kind of this. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the greatest things that happened was, and um, Colleen, who's right next to you, can probably speak to this even better, is um, they're a venue, they're an amazing venue, probably like a lot of your venues that have to meet a lot of different needs within the community and present everything from the challenging and avant-garde to the familiar and, and um, I don't know what's a good word for it, audience and family friendly. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's got, you know, trying to fill that demand and one of the things that we talked about is perhaps this work that was taking some traditional native Hawaiian hula and chant with modern dance and storytelling and fusing it in a somewhat unique way, I wouldn't call it terribly unique might help bridge the audience. And at our work in progress showing that concluded the event for which she was preparing me to have about 50 people, we had 276 show up. And it was, um, to my purview, a real mix of people that would have been attending hula shows and people that might have been coming more for you know, concert dance or music. It was just a really eclectic mix. So I think that was the number one kind of testament to that. But then in the um, post-show discussion that happened afterwards, um, one of the things that I was hopeful for and did hear more than once was that even though it was a very particular story, the story of me and my family, the decision of my parents to leave Hawaii and what that's created afterwards, it reflects many things that are going on still there mm -hmm. for the people that haven't left. The identity questions, the tensions that they feel, um, questions around you know, racial conflict that still exists in these um, very uh, diverse islands. So. I think that was one of the things. It's true, I still need to work on my hula and get stronger and better at it. I've had less time in the studio doing that than I have had other physical practices that are in my body, but that's going to be the case my whole life because I should be dancing hula into my 80s anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Maura Brennan from the MAP Fund, and I'm, I wanted to ask, uh, Christopher or anybody who wants to speak to it a little bit more about what, we're, what you were saying about um, how it feels to understand you are adding diversity to a, say, a, you know, a cohort of grantees and um, sort of the, the complications around that for you as artists. Um, we're, we're established um, explicitly to fund, um, I don't really love the word diversity, but for shorthand, we'll say that. Sure. Um, and at the same time, I recognize that identifying artists in one way or another, you know, in categories like that is, is inherently problematic. So just exploring those yeah. thoughts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's so complex. I, so you saw everything there that's still there, Christopher K. Morgan. That came about um, when I first entered one of the unions and there was already a Christopher Morgan. Uh, AGMA, I think, was the first union that I joined, Performing Arts Union. Then when I went in to join Equity, there was already a Christopher K. Morgan, so I spelled out Kawi. This goes to things about structural racism that are so deep that I couldn't even chart it as a young man myself. I did not know until my 20s that um, Hawaiian first names were banned uh, starting in the late 1800s, so everyone took Hawaiian middle names, which was a tra tradition that still could exists in many places today. And my parents named all of my brothers and sisters and myself with um, Christian first names and Hawaiian middle names. And so as I started to embrace that at a certain point in my professional career, I thought this is really interesting. This is a bit of a long-winded answer, I'm sorry. Um, and so that just you know, started unpacking all of these kind of historical things that I didn't even understand, just in choosing a name to join a union. Um, and so when I, interestingly, the K stuck because it just came a little sooner in the advent of my professional career, and I just kept using it and using it, and then it was in written correspondence, and people would call me that all the time. 
So it just stuck, and I actually tried for a little while to do the full Hawaiian middle name, and it, it didn't stick. So I was like, okay, whatever, that's who I am. I'll embrace it. And then um, a couple presenters kind of earlier in my career as a choreographer said, why don't you put the whole Hawaiian name down? It would be to your advantage. And in that moment, I resisted. I said, no, I want the work to be what it is and to stand on its own, whatever that means. Um, and so there was this just internal dialogue and tension that I had around that. It's one of those really challenging things where, you know, I encourage people all the time, if you see the opportunity, jump in and take advantage of it. You know, the other thing that I know is my zip code, 20852. It's not one of the 100s, <laughs> New York City versus all these other places. That is also to my advantage, probably. I've sat on enough Grant panels to know the reality of that. And I think that's an important and good thing in order to make the invisible visible from the top down, we have to be inclusive and make efforts, and I fully support that. It just feels complex, and there's no getting around that, and I don't think it's a bad thing, um, and part of me identifying that and owning it is helping to be more comfortable with it. Uh, I don't know if I'm really answering your questions, well, but I feel I Rosie to... lean forward. So <laughs> <laughs> no? Go ahead, Rosie. Please, okay. save me. <laughs> You're doing great. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so there are over 562 federally recognized tribes. It isn't possible. I mean, there's diversity within diversity. And so as an artist who is also native, um, living in that world, that uh, two worlds, um, it's very complex because in one moment it feels like it's in one moment it feels like who I am is being consumed or commodified in a particular way for a particular use which is not one that I can control nor is it something that I necessarily want so, um, yeah, I have a lot more to say about <laughs> I don't know, I don't think that answered your question. But. It's a very broad question, and yeah. I understand that it's incredibly complex, and already what you said is wonderful. I'll bring one more thing to light as a conversation Rosie and I have. Um, we blessedly met on the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. We were fe co-fellows in dance in 2013. And she sent me an email and was like, hey, fellow. And, uh, and now I feel like she's a friend and mentor and, and partner in crime sometimes. All of us have to be so diligent, diligent about how our, our brand is represented in a marketing sense. And I remember about a year or so ago, we were talking and she was saying, gosh, I just have to be on top of this language that's going out in relationship to, um, I think it was for We Wait in Darkness, yeah. and how the native aspect of this work is being represented. Um, and so as much as the opportunity is a blessing, it comes with an extra responsibility to create a template that um, allows other people to follow in the footsteps, and whether that's um, a completely different type of identity, but a, a template that allows people to self-identify clearly and assertively so that whatever the marketing materials are, whether from the grantor or the presenter, are representative of what the artist is trying to convey. And I understand that there's a lot of tension in that and how you're trying to gain audiences and all of those things and you know, self-producing. Sometimes I have to do that too. But I think that was one of the things that was really important to me is um, you know, that I don't falsely advertise that I'm doing hula. I actually had someone at this conference last year in Tulsa introduce me at a party as the guy that does hula. And if any hula person ever said that, if Vivi Holtakamina from Pai, Pai Foundation said that, I would be mortified, like embarrassed, because I'm not a traditional practitioner and I don't possess the knowledge. And in two sentences I could remedy that and laugh about it, and it was totally fine. But what if I hadn't actually been there in that moment? What if someone said, oh, there's that guy that does hula? Oh my gosh, like I'm, you know, I'm not completely ignorant about that form, but I cannot say that it is, it is my form. So that's one of the many ways that, that like due diligence is really necessary and kind of layers into all of that. And I think this demonstrates really some of that. I mean, this is really a very <coughs> complex issue with uh, indigeneity, 
uh, multiple, you know, really who we are as Native peoples, who, who we are as human beings, and uh, the, all the things that weave into being a Native artist, we find that at the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, and <coughs> we're trying to be attentive to all of the, the, the indigenous population across the nation, Alaska and Hawaii, and but from more contemporary ethnographic historic art artists to more contemporary um, artists that are doing really edgy, innovative work. And, um, and the, the, the impetus for people to want to kind of categorize things, all of us, all of us have an, you know, we want to put things in categories to try to help create meaning and understanding to talk about them. But in a sense, that's what's creating, you know, it's, it's a lot of the difficulties uh, mm -hmm. around, in particular, that the indigenous peoples are facing. So I want to I want to move us on. I saw my little the timekeeper over there <laughs> and Rosie. Oh, so I'm next. you're next. Oh dear. So uh, you can talk more about okay. whatever you want. <laughs> Sorry. And here, why don't you come here? Here, yeah. so you get your new notes. Of course, I can't do any. That's everything I do is complicated. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm Rosie Seamus. I am Onondaga. Um, in English, that is Seneca. Um, we are part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which is uh, Seneca is known to them as keepers of the Western Door. We're also known as the people of the Great Hill. So yes, complicated, right? Oh, you can't hear me. Sorry. <clears throat> I'm also Heron Clan. Um, our people are matrilineal. We get our identity and our clan and our inheritance from our mother, grandmother, our great grandmother. Um, so I grew up in between two cultures, like I said before, um, in a very urban Indian, very political family, um, going to ceremonies and powwows. And then I also um, was very much um, dedicated to my theater arts high school that I attended. And so I had these sort of like two polar um, opposite lives as I started to enter the arts. Um, before I show any images, um, hmm, maybe I just want to show them. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you. Do I have to click on my name? No, click uh, just the arrow. Just the arrow. Okay. Rosie, could I just share the lyrics a little bit so we can see your Yes. Yes. <coughs> I'll bring it back up after a book. Okay. So over the last 23 years, I've made work dealing with a wide range of subject matters, from the Iraq War to black holes, one of my favorite pieces that I've made to my grandmother's boarding school experience. And for many reasons, which I'm gonna talk about in the next seven minutes, um, my work now examines cultural, political, and identity issues of Native people. But, so is it just, this is not me. Oh, that's Rudy. <laughs> is mine a movie? Is that, yes. Is, Okay, so but I can pause it. So this uh yeah, it keeps going right. It's space for it to pause. Okay. Thanks, Andre. What Andre? It's, it's space, space for it to pause and unpause. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this beautiful um, that didn't work. Oh. Okay, so I'm gonna improvise. I'm just gonna talk over the video. <laughs> Okay, so this beautiful picture is of my third great grandmother. This is this is not going to work for me. Um, <laughs> this is a, a poem. Okay, thanks. No, I meant that. Yeah. So, so the the why is the picture significant? So, I wanted to talk about where my work comes from, um, and that's very very important to me because I think that. Um, I'll get labeled very much as a like political artist or a native artist, and um, identity is a big issue for me. So, so my work is very personal, 
and um, this piece that I created that's still touring, We Wait in the Darkness, um, started with this picture. So this picture um, is of my third great grandmother on my um, grandmother's side. And when, I, when I, I've had it hanging on my wall since I was a child, and I asked my mom, like, who is this person? I realized I actually didn't even know. She didn't know, no one in my family knew. And um, I was completely devastated. I come from a matrilineal people. This person is a key to my identity. So um, I spent a lot of time doing research, and um, I found this poem. It says, we wait in darkness. And I started this dialogue with my grandmothers, um, who were doctors, who were Seneca doctors. Um, they're gone. But I was in the mountains, and um, I just started talking to them. And so I started to uh, investigate things. So we can just show some of the images now and we can just play. So I went back home, um, and uh, this is an Anandaga, and this is me. <laughs> and um, this is where my mother learned how to swim. Uh, as a child, um, and this, let's pause here, is uh, the Allegheny Reserve. This is kin to a dam. Um, my ancestors are buried underneath this water. And so all of this culminated into a piece. Um, this is Corn Planter. This is my fifth great grandfather. I included this image because um, he was the key. Um, it always helps to be related to someone famous <laughs> if you're trying to do any kind of genealogy. And so, although I know tons of my grandfather's side of the family, um, I did it on that side of my family. And so that portrait, you can go see it in New York, it hangs above George Washington's portrait. Um, this is a, a relocation map um, over, uh, I'll just say all Senecas were um, displaced by the flooding of our lands. This is a relocation map. So all of this uh, became a piece, and it became an exhibit. Let's just go ahead and play. Um, paper and fabric and all of this came into becoming something that um, was an expression of this search um, for my grandmother and my conversations with the people in my family who are gone. Uh, this was at All My Relation Arts in Minneapolis. Um, so my grandmother and mom, objects my grandmother made, and my extensive map collection of Seneca lands and the diminishing of Seneca lands over the last 500 years. This is the set, now I'm just gonna let the video play.
of my cousin Robert, who died when he was 93. And we were very close. He, is on, he was on Indaga. And his children, although also from one white parent and one native parent, are not native. And I am native. <clears throat> so this is part of our complex identity. <laughs> And I want to share with you two videos of a piece called Redskins, um, and then talk about how this picture of my cousin and uh, this dance, which I'm currently developing, are related. So um, this piece, uh, Redskins, is, uh, was two dance studies that were performed um, at the Talking Stick Festival in Vancouver, which is an amazing native performing arts festival that I think all of you should go to. But um, it was sort of my first exploration into this complexity of um, native identity. And um, then I got to go to the uh, Santa Fe um, Museum of Contemporary Native Art and do a residency there and I got to come in contact with this amazing object um, which is uh, um, a seal gut jacket and um, from that uh, how am I doing double like two minutes? Yeah, you're over. Oh, I'm gonna <laughs> stop actually. Okay, so I'll just show a couple of things planned to say. <laughs> well, I'll come back to you afterwards. Okay, all right. About <laughs> These are made inspired by the
well, as a human being, my life changed like eight years ago when I had my beautiful daughter, and that also affected everything in my life, including my art practice. Um, and I was very much inspired, like I did a lot of sewing, started to do a lot of sewing based because of uh, Beatrice and other things. But one of the struggles of being a parent is, you know, how do you include your kid or that guilty feeling you get when you're not able to, you know, work with, uh, they have to stay home or, or those kind of things. Or like for instance, when you bring them to a panel and, and <laughs> you're worried that people will judge you because your kid's gonna, you know, um, so there's always that kind of feeling. Um, but something kind of magical happened. In 2014, I had a solo ex exhibition at the Portland Art Museum um, called Medicine Crow and the 1880 Crow Peace Delegation. And I wanted to focus on this chief who um, I grew up with his descendants. And I kept seeing him when I would, um, after I left the reservation, when I turned uh, 18. And for instance, I was just at Dartmouth not too long ago giving a lecture and walking down the street and there, there his face was again on a bargain book sale. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I got the opportunity to show at the Portland Art Museum, I decided I need to investigate this because another interesting thing uh, that happened to me was in graduate school, I used to go to Whole Foods and just get honest tea because this image was also on honest tea. <laughs> and I was like, well, people keep appropriating this image and they see him as this, this handsome chief, but what happened to Medicine Crow when he decided to sit down and take that photograph? What's the story behind that? Um, and I wanted to expose that. Um, so <coughs> the long story short is that uh, Medicine Crow at age 36, along with six other chiefs, went to Washington, D.C. to uh, talk with the government because they wanted to uh, put a railroad through a large chunk of our hunting territory. So that's why he was there. And then the main uh, BIA uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs chief photographer took his photo. And as the case is most uh, uh, tribal nations, they would get their photograph taken. So that's what that was about. Uh, but while working on this, um, I decided it was really important for me to humanize who these chiefs were and let people know what they were about, not just this really striking image, but what their output meant, um, the significance behind it. Basically, they're showing their war honors and what they did. So I would break that down. So I was physically working on that. And then Beatrice, you know, would come up to me. I'm working at night. My studio is in my living room at my house. And I had a deadline. I had to get this stuff done. Um, so I had a bunch of Xerox copies, and I said, well, here you go, Beatrice. I'm going to just give you a bunch of these, and you go, you know, do whatever you want with them in your room. And I didn't even think about it. And so I continued to work, and then Beatrice came back with this. And I thought, well, this is what this exhibition is about. It's about uh, the next generation, and, and then, like, not stereotyping or appropriating those images. And this, she needs to be in this exhibition because she needs to represent that voice. Um, so I got really excited. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I decided to make extra copies. And I could go ahead and let Beatrice go ahead and speak. Can you stand up? Can you tell me to talk about your process? Um, well, I'd like to say that I would not be here um, today if I did not have a mom like Wendy. And when I made um, um, that picture, I was in my room, and I wanted to um, just um, tell you something in because um, the real part is she only gave me that medicine for one. She didn't give me the whole stack in the first part. So I wanted to actually use it because I had nothing to do. And I had gone this um, new box of like, um, this new art kit, which is right over there in the picture that my um, grandpa sent me, and I decided to use it, and I really, and I um, covered it all in different things um, that, so I could make the picture really colorful and stuff, because I didn't want um, to make it have the original colors because they were so bland. And um, <coughs> then um, I thought um, I made like 36 of them or something. Um, and now when they went into the art museum mm -hmm. and I brought my class in and talked about them. Um, 
because then at the very um, end, um, I got a picture of my class with me um, in front of the picture of all the chiefs and some other guys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this was incredible because, uh, so we did the opening and, uh, you know, I'm like, here's VHS's work. I have no idea what she's going to, you know, I have no control what's going to come out of her mouth. Um, but she wanted to talk and she talked and she did an excellent job. But um, she said I talked way too much. And then we set up uh, her, her school to come because it was uh, November and it was Native Americans um, Heritage Month. And, and so that was really great, because um, I could never connect to these kids like she could connect with them. And she talked about the entire exhibition and really owned it. Um, and then Oregon Art Beat uh, picked us up and did a little segment on, on us. And then we were in several different uh, magazine publications together with various work. But since then, Beatrice and I have worked with the Seattle Art Museum. We've worked with the Tacoma Art Museum. We're going to be working again with the Portland Art Museum in February for the uh, Curtis show. And she's also gone to Kansas City with me. Um, and then just, just the experience of her sitting here on this panel and getting to see all of these artists and curators talk about Native contemporary <coughs> work has been really incredible. And part of my thing is also getting institutions used to having mothers or parents bring their kids and allow them to be part of their practice. She is very much part of my practice and she's very professional. Um, and, um, I, and I want to continue working with her uh, as long as she thinks it's good and cool. And if, when she doesn't, then that, that's, that's just the natural process of it. So, thank you. Thank you. That, you know, I mean, this is so, um, I would say this. This is just so, I would say, but see, I don't want to sound like it's categorizing too much, but it is so native. Um, you know, uh, how do we raise up the next generations? I mean, this is a question all of us have to, we're all considering, but certainly in our indigenous native communities, how do we, how do we raise up the next generations? How do we, um, help them to expose them to uh, the kinds of things that are really important for, for children. And, and especially as, as she says, as a contemporary art, a visual artist and a mother, um, you know, what better way than to, to bring your child into the, into the process. So uh, and it's really, really beautiful. I, I want to thank all of them for presenting, but what I want to do before we uh, and we have some more time here today is to open up and let's let's engage in some more discussion with with any any of the four but in, in the last two that we that you just heard at, but just let's just open it up now for a full any more questions comments thoughts uh, I also encourage the um, to ask the tough questions one of the things that I have um, that I have uh, it's sort of a pet peeve I have I have some concerns about it uh, more personally um, about the kind of discussions that we're having in our civil society today is um, is the fear of um, asking the tough question for being uh, the fear of being politically incorrect the fear of being misunderstood the fear of being categorized into a box if I ask that question and make that comment but it's those kinds of things that are really important as really distinct, unique human beings that we all are, to be able to have that kind of civil discourse, to be able to ask the tough questions, to be able to, to explain when, how something may, you may think is a, a question will be offensive or something, or make you, make, and you may seem um, ignorant or whatever that, I just say, say, ask the tough questions, the comments, things you don't understand. I, I, I encourage you to do that. So, let's open it up. Yeah, Olga. So, um, thank you guys for doing this. This is really fantastic. <laughs> and I especially want to thank Lulani, who um, just 
got into this and, and really made it happen. So thank you so much for doing it. I guess I don't know that this is necessarily a tough question, but um, one of the projects that um, I'm helping to raise money for is um, there's a, a, a very internationally renowned um, Samoan a choreographer, I, I shared the information with you, his name is Lemmy Ponifacio, and um, you know, they, they categorize him as the, the Samoan Bob Wilson or something because they can't figure out, you know, his work is just so um, fantastical. Um, and he is working now with Mapuche Indians in Chile. And the question that I have is that um, there's so little support in the United States for cultural exchange with other countries. And, and, and it seems like, um, you know, when Native people, even, even if their experiences and cultures are radically different, there seems to be um, a real desire and need for them to share, you know, their experiences and their art forms, et cetera. And I'm just wondering, you know, it, it almost seems like hearing you guys that that the way the fund, going back to your question more, that, you know, s some of our very funding mechanisms limit the amount of, you know, of um, opportunity for first peoples to get to know each other and to work together. And, you know, uh, you know, Lulani, when I first started telling her about this extraordinary artist, Levi Konifasio, She's like, uh, yeah, but you know, we can only fund in the, we can't even fund Canada, you know? And it seems like we're imposing national borders, which is almost like double, you know, double the, the um, cloistering effect. And I'm just wondering, you know, what is your experience working with people, native people outside the United States context? And anybody can answer. Okay. So, <clears throat> recently, well, went to the Talking Stick Festival that, that takes place in Canada, right? So you have represented probably over 50 different nations, which is how we refer to ourselves. And I applied to an unnamed foundation that supports international festivals. And I was invited to go to this festival. And they said, well, there's only two countries being represented, um, Canada and the US. And I said, well, that's not true. There are over 50 nations being represented at this festival. And you are imposing not only borders, but your ideas. Uh, they never responded to my email about that. <laughs> <laughs> but this is actually quite a large problem. It's not so, I wouldn't say that all of us are super interested in engaging with other tribes, but it is in a way, or nations, it is in a way kind of um, inherent in us to want to, um, especially like Christopher and I are two native choreographers who work in the contemporary arena of like less than five maybe in this country. So for us to share is so important for us to um, be more visible. We're gonna keep talking about invisibility and visibility. <clears throat> um, but I think that you're absolutely right in terms of like one of the main, that is a big part of invisibility is just the fact that there are a lot of systems that don't even recognize the fact that we are so many, even you know on Turtle Island, we are so many different nations if some tribes um, put um, together some of the differences, but um, it's also really interesting to have all these different tribes who do different things and none of them are alike. So it, it's also a good thing that um, no tribes are squished together in different things. Um, but some tribes can share 
um, share different things that the same tribe does. And like with um, certain kinds of dances and outfits and ideas for like what you wear. Um, but I think it's actually very good for um, to have all these different tribes because there's then just different things to experience if you ever went to any of the other tribes. Yeah. I've had a couple of um, cultural exchange um, experiences, one as a graduate student and then one that I got to run um, at the University of Washington. There's more funding for indigenous groups to come together um, under the arts umbrella than than there is coming together under any kind of solidarity movement or political, right? There's very little funding for that. So in my experience working with the Maori um, and helping to facilitate an exchange um, between the Maori and the, and the um, Oregon Indian folks, and then um, at the University of Washington, um, we did an exchange with the Ainu of Northern Japan um, and the Puget Sound Native people. And under the sort of umbrella of the arts, there were all of this, I mean, this fascinating and really empowering dialogue around um, political strategies, right? Uh, the Ainu had just recently been recognized by their national government. Um, and, um, and so connecting them with Coast Salish people who have a, a greater sense of autonomy because they have access to half of the fish catch. Um, the Washington tribes do, um, bringing them together to share their art forms and also to share their pra their art practice was was um, incredible. But what happens is these other conversations about identity and about sovereignty and about indigenous law and the the kinds of conversations that really do need to happen. Um, and um, I mean, the, the the Ainu are so isolated because of the language barrier. Um, it was so enriching for them to be able to, and we, you know, we wore our translators out, of course, over the course of the the, um, the year uh, exchange. But it was really valuable on so many levels, even though we came together around the arts. So I mean, I I, I agree that the we we have as indigenous people had to find have had to find ways around those rather rigid parameters that funding agencies have or that organizations have or that our institutions have, for Pete's sake. I mean, um, just as a curator of Native American art, <laughs> that's right, I'm, I'm entirely pigeonholed and, and, and there's a certain set of expectations that comes along with that. And so, yeah, it would be nice if all of those labels would sort of dissipate and allow us to be people working with other people. I'll just say, because even at this table, this is actually for me an international exchange. Mm -hmm. So just to give some idea about that. <coughs> you another question? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to wonder, does it, it sounds like it, is it possible when you're categorized as a native artist, you feel it, it can diminish your reach or your ability to actually get a wider audience because you're in some division hold and people think they know what they, they're getting. I mean, it's how this is, it's complicated. I guess, I guess the answer, but is it a benefit or a, in some ways it hurts? I mean, how does this? And that's a really good question. That's actually one of the questions that I asked them all to consider uh, and, and address. So you, you brought it up. <laughs> I think, yes, it's incredibly complicated. It is a pigeonhole. Um, it's also who I am. And one thing that I was thinking about is, you know, I purposely chose not to show too much native looking work because it's ingrained in who I am. The values of how my parents raised me are greatly influenced, just like anyone, by where they come from um, and who their ancestors were. And so no matter what I do, it has the print of aloha on it. I can't get away from it. Um, and so I think that's an interesting thing that that identity, you know, is ever present. It makes me think about even as you were just saying and as you were somewhat asking like how we categorize things, there's huge aspects around 
kind of native funding that I don't even know about because I'm kind of more from a concert and modern dance idiom primarily, so I know about how to apply for those kinds of grants. If, it, if I were doing politicized work, if I were doing work that was really trying to bridge you know, gaps in that particular community, I might be investigating different things that I don't know about. So one of the things that resonates with me is how do we start creating um, a more fluid exchange, a more porous atmosphere for these funding streams that look at how art is social justice. You know, that's so in vogue right now. Art's always been social justice, hello. <laughs> like just because there's a $100,000 grant out for it now doesn't mean that it hasn't always been there. It's always been there. That's, you know, especially in the United States, it's been like one of the primary roles of art. So it's just interesting like when, when that happens and when things become porous again, artists as social justice and activists, as community builders, as people engaging their family and multi-generational work, how can porous structures happen and how can we slide through that more gracefully and then allow or transmit the knowledge that people know about those things and how do we get that information out. I was so moved I was able to sit in on a town hall meeting that the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation um, convened in Hawaii a couple years ago and all these people that I think really do not know about grants and how to apply for them showed up. And one of the biggest things that the program officer at that time, um, the amazing Ruben Rokenyi, who's here from Hewlett um, right now, um, did was he kept talking about, and Lulani as well, but how can we reach out to the people that need this type of funding to embrace them? And so I'm like kind of thinking about both of those things right now, but it, it's very interesting to think about the structures that we live in and then how do we dissipate those to get to people because it's all there it's just how we find them and embrace them each other um i just wanted to add that as a, a native artist um things are already put on put on us that, that want to be put on uh, like a white artist there's like a white artist blank canvas you can do anything you want but as a native artist um, let's say I don't do anything about my cultural background. People are always going to ask me, like, why don't you do something about your cultural background? You know, <laughs> when they would never say that to a white artist. So I really do think things are put on us as a native artist, a, an artist of color, a, as a female artist. Um, so those are all things that, um, unfortunately, we're in this position that we have to deal with all the time. And, it, and to me, it really isn't about me. It's about um, whoever's putting it on me and how I want to negotiate negotiate that. So I think that is really important to keep in mind. It's, um, we live in a colonial state. I found it so interesting when some people laughed when Shiloh claimed her Irish and Scottish clans today. I thought that was really telling. That's a big part of who she is. Why did that create a ripple of laughter in the room? As much as her Native American Indian tribe did. I just, I was really, I really noted that. Yes? Hi, I just had a question for Rosie about, you, you made a comment for a moment about, uh, I'm just interested in digging a little deeper into the identity, like how, I, how we understand identity. So you, you made a comment that your cousin's child is not native, and I was wondering if that meant legally or racially or culturally or what exactly you were indicating there? Well, we have a very, we have very complex identities. Um, we are intertribal, interracial, and um, the system of identifying Native people by the U.S. government is mainly blood quantum, you know, which is just basically a systematic genocide of Indigenous people over time. Um, because with that, with forced assimilation, or you could call it voluntary relocation, <clears throat> um, those two things together change our makeup. So um, I'm interested in, in how do we identify each other in the future, which is what my next piece is, is about. And I, I really want to, through my next work, celebrate the beauty, the complexity, the tragedy in all of that, and that's why that piece says that to me, because my cousins are not native, but I am, because we belong to a matrilineal tribe. We actually don't, um, our tribes do not um, use blood quantum <clears throat> for, very, for reasons that I, we don't have time to explain. But just going back to the other question for a second, um, 
one of the things that I've learned through this touring of this last work um, is how the desire to consume my work and sensationalize my story in a particular way by certain audiences. And I'm trying to find ways to get around that by having a real discourse and not whatever this monotonous thing is that we're having between each other, between native artists and, and non-native people. <clears throat> Our art is consumed um, without us existing for the most part. I mean, native people for the most part are invisible in this country, contemporary living native people. But our art and our culture are consumed and appropriated at a mass scale. And so when you separate the art from the person, from the living, you have something different going on here. So I say this and people don't understand it, but I'll say it anyway. So I author my work for other Native people. And I do that because that's who I want to share these stories that I'm talking about with. But I also want to share it with everybody else. And I think through that sort of genuinely authoring as opposed to educating or edutainment or whatever you want to call it, that people who are not Native can have a different experience of my work that isn't so much about trying to consume a story about me. And that's what I can do on my end. Um, we'll see what other people do. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone, anyone of you offered $250,000 to be a stereotype of your community, would you do it? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah. 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 Or 300000 for I don't know if I'm clever enough to pull that off in a way that it would really work. <laughs> but yeah, no. <laughs> okay, you over here. Yeah, it's a very question. It's a good question. It's challenging. Uh, the, the notions of contem contemporaneity and kind of contemporary versus traditional, and the kind of the, I come from Australia originally, and the, there's a pretty rich indigenous, and much more. It feels like a much more visible performance culture from contemporary indigenous artists, and there's a more fluid conversation between what contemporary and traditional and I'm wondering why it doesn't seem like there's that same kind of dialogue that is at least visible here and, and, and what we can do about it. So first you have to define traditional and you have to define contemporary, right? So in, in my limited view of the history of my people, and we have always been uh, contemporary. And, and contemporary, is always responsive to the here and now. So what we what we perceive as traditional was at one time contemporary. So it depends on like what is your what is your goal? What are you what are you? Um, do I dance in the longhouse? Yes. Do I do that on stage? No. Um, does it mean that I'm not traditional? No. But the whole sense of of why can't traditional and contemporary ex exist in the same, like, continuing over, and this is part of where I think that this perception of us as this, like, historical people of the past that are somehow romanticized in these ideas, you know, um, projected by Edward Curtis and other people, um, are part of what our invisibility is. So I don't talk about traditional for part of that reason, and I know I'm just complicating your question and not really answering it, but I think they probably have a better answer, or Wendy, or well, Beatrice. <laughs> I was just going to offer one thought from kind of the Hawaiian community's perspective. I think, and a lot of ethnic traditional dance forms and performing arts forms, I think, have similar parallels, 
it's partly a, a kind of culture that's fully integrated so that the family is doing the dancing and the singing and it happens in casual and communal, communal environments and that the groups that are practitioners of that work often are getting together in community settings and are not necessarily part of a funding circle, a presenter circuit. They tend to be renters in venues. And, and so there's a kind of different cultural practice around that that's, again, separating, so this is where I think the porousness becomes interesting, separating it from the consumable culture that is funded, produced, presented, and quote unquote professional. And one of the things that I think is super challenging about the work that the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation is doing is it's trying to reach out to practitioners, cultural practitioners, who are not in that conversation. And I think if those two conversations could merge a little bit more, there could be more of this dialogue, at least in the environments that I am around and I see. How do those things start to connect? Let's have one more question. And Can I just know. speak to that? Oh, just really yes, quick, just a very, I, I'm just curious, I, you know, um, as we all have spoken to this idea of invisibility, all of the Australian Aboriginal folks that I've ever spoken to feel completely invisible in Australia. So I would be really interested to hear what, um, what us Australian Indigenous people feel about the visibility or the sort of uh, richness of the performance art in, in Australia. Um, I mean, I think the same could be said for the U.S. or for New Zealand. Um, we, no matter what, no matter what the um, the public's perception is, we there's still a, a a sense that we have about it. Does that make sense? Totally. I, I, I mean, as someone who runs a contemporary performing arts center, we've done one work made by an indigenous mm -hmm. artist in eleven years, mm -hmm. which is my bad. As the artistic director, obviously, but at the same time, you know, in, in one of the major festivals there in New Zealand or in Australia, or, uh, if you were to put on a season without work by Aboriginal playwrights or using Aboriginal performance, it would be equivalent to doing an, a purely all-white kind of male season here. People would call you on it, and, uh, and, and yet that doesn't seem to happen. It would happen with African American work here, but it doesn't happen with Indigenous. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, right there in the back. Um, Christopher, you mentioned that your um, some of your family members think you, you know, you're not Native enough. Um, so I guess I I'm curious from all of you um, how much pressure you feel from within your own. <laughs> I um, I think it's really interesting because I think any any person of color goes through identity struggles. Um, like I said, just because we're in a colonized nation, you know, we're, we're we've been assimilated. You know, people want us. The whole thing was to erase and make us white. Um, so I don't know. I've I've reached the point where I'm very comfortable and. When I raise Beatrice, I want her to be comfortable and um, just own who she is at any point of her life. And I know she's got her own identity struggles that she's going to go through, but for me, it, it's just it's it's sort of pointless because it it breaks down to again, like I said, colonization. If someone's going to point a finger at me, I can point a finger at you and say why you're not such and such either. So it's just, it doesn't, it really doesn't matter. It's mat it, what matters is what you believe in and, and how you feel. And, and then I think that will show, you know. Um, so, uh, of course, you know, Crow, uh, I don't, I, I guess it's a, it's a maturity thing. And when I think about back home and that pressure, I didn't have it. When I was in fifth grade, I was embarrassed to be white. I wouldn't walk with my mom. And I was just talking to my dad yesterday on the phone. He said, oh, do you remember that time when you would, um, if your mom was walking, if you were walking with us and your mom was walking by your side, you'd like go around me and walk on my side? And he was like chuckling about it. And I said, yeah, 
I do, but I just think, man, I must have been being harassed or something at school. It kind of makes me sad to think about it because now I totally embrace every every part of myself, like being half white, and um, that's who, what makes me me. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's 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 your own personal journey, and everybody goes through it. Um, I think that um, um, if you um, really um, love this part of yourself, but then you have a different part that you don't love as much, I think you should um, still love both of them because even though I um, really love my crow side, but I still um, have a more white side um, that Sometimes I think about it, and I think, I wonder how that happened, and why it happened. But I think that everybody should um, be happy that they're themselves, and be glad that they're um, here with everybody else today. Woo! <laughs> really quick, I'll just say, I come from a very, very strict, uh, reservation community um, and I was terrified um, but I presented this work uh, within like a 10 mile radius like the closest I could get to and I interviewed elders and people came to the show and I was just like oh my god I'm just gonna be excommunicated and it was the complete opposite and I was stunned and I understand that there is some um, times that tension between um, this idea of who is and who isn't because I myself have had a lot of spiritual dilemma about my own ideas of recognizing who is Native and who isn't, who's traditional, who isn't, who's really Native, um, how much Native are you, that whole kind of thing. And um, I think that uh, we're, f we're figuring that out. I mean, not just as artists, but as people, um, <clears throat> how to uh, recognize each other and how to hold each other up in different ways. We have to, if we want to survive. Okay. All right, everybody. <coughs> Real last few notes, uh, through uh, last few comments here. I just want to say that I uh, again thank that uh, MPN and Van for inviting us. I'm really happy that we've uh, that uh, you all came and you took the time. And uh, these it, it is difficult topics, but we had some. I want to thank each of our panelists, Christopher, Dina, and I want to also just acknowledge I have some staff here, Andre, who's been the timekeeper because of our program. And I got Francine Blythe, she's our program director, stand, uh, sitting back there with that red scarf around her neck. <laughs> and of course, we love Ruben back there. He's our founding program director, and now over at Hewlett. So, hi, Ruben. <laughs> um, and Colleen, I have a lot of you. Hi from the uh, All My Relations Gallery. Just uh, great to see some the familiar faces here and new faces. And you know, I think, I guess in closing, we, we need to do some evaluations, I know. They want to make sure, but I think, you know, in today's fractured nation that we have, we need uh, more than ever, I mean, more than ever, we need to have societies built on inclusion, understanding, and respect for one another. And uh, that's the problems we're facing in today really aren't just political. So people think that these challenges right, both nationally and internationally are, polit are just political and challenging barriers to, to world peace and understanding also are cultural. It is about really sharing our, our arts and cultures, our ways of being, our ways of thinking, and our own individuality, and our own experiences. And that offers us that chance to learn and grow as citizens of this global, finite Mother Earth that we all share together. She'll be here for another billion years. She started a billion years ago, she'll be here for another billion years. Whatever happens to us humans, so if we can get our act together, maybe we'll be here with her. So thank you, everybody, and um, I think we have. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you can grab
have an evaluation